When watching a horror movie, you can expect to see terror, blood, guts, gore, and sometimes a crazy person chasing a screaming teenage girl. Despite how realistic these movies can appear thanks to the brilliant actors and production team and everyone behind the film, most of us understand that these horror movies are pieces of fiction which should never be replicated. However, for some people, the line between fiction and reality can blur and they can go on to commit the unthinkable. Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. Thank you so much for being here with me. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe because that's what this channel is all about. You can also click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about a killer who was dubbed the Saw 6 murderer after he brutally murdered his own roommate, taking inspiration from his favourite fiction villain Jigsaw. I'm True Crime Caitlin and this is the murder of Richard Hamilton. Matthew Nicholas Tinling was born in Stanwell which is just outside of London in 1986. He had a pretty unremarkable upbringing he would describe his childhood as okay. When he was still quite young Matthew's parents separated and he stayed living with his mum and sister while his dad moved out. Within the home there was a bit of friction between Matthew and his mum. He would accuse her of favouring his sister over him because she was more academic than he was. Because of this he sort of floated between living with his mum and living with his nana. For a very brief time when he was a teenager he did live with his dad however social services removed him from his dad's house and placed him back in the care of his mum. I read a report that said this came after Matthew's dad had physically abused him however Matthew would later deny this in a separate report he said that there was no sort of family violence or abuse. At school Matthew was a part of the wrong crowd who introduced him into the world of drugs. By the time he was 13 he was already regularly smoking weed and as he got older his drug use would only escalate. By the time he was 15 year old, Matthew had been expelled from school. He very briefly took part in some sort of college program, but he would leave that with no qualifications as well. He did pick up little jobs here and there. He worked as a bin man for a little bit and he also worked in a supermarket, but he was never able to hold down any of these jobs or any other jobs that he may have gotten and he eventually was living off of benefits. Matthew at this point though wasn't just a regular drug user, he was a full blown addict. It wasn't just weed anymore though, he had begun abusing crack cocaine and heroin. He would do anything to get his fix, he would steal, he would spend every penny of his monthly benefits on drugs which ultimately left him homeless. His parents did try to intervene and they tried supporting and helping him but you just can't help someone who doesn't want the help and Matthew didn't. He was utterly consumed by his addiction and everything else in his life came secondary to it. After a while of trying to help and support Matthew, his family eventually had to stop. I know firsthand how physically, mentally and emotionally draining it can be trying to help someone who is so consumed by their drug addiction and trying to help them can really take a toll on your own life. And I know how draining that is. So Matthew's family, they had to kind of let Matthew get on with it, take a step away from him. They couldn't do any more to help him. He didn't want the help. So after this, they didn't have much of a relationship. In August 2011, after living on the streets, 25-year-old Matthew was given an amazing opportunity. A charity were running a hostel where they would take in homeless people and addicts and they would provide them with accommodation. This was under the circumstance that they were going to receive treatment for their addiction and try to get clean. The hostel was based on Sherland Road in Maida Vale, London. And although in theory this was an amazing idea designed to try and help people get Get back on their feet. For many of the residents being surrounded by other addicts where many of them are not even trying to get sober and where drugs are so easily accessible, it wasn't beneficial for them on terms of their sobriety. They now had a roof over their head but they were surrounded with temptation and were very much still in the clutch of their addiction. Within the hostel, Matthew wasn't liked at all. He was very much the type of person where he would rather have control over you than actually be your friend. 
Other residents would describe him as an intimidating bully who was aggressive and antisocial. He was known to have a fixation, borderline obsession with horror movies. For him, the gorier and the scarier, the better. And I'm just going to intervene here quickly and say that I am in no way insinuating that Matthew's love of horror movies is what caused his upcoming actions. Enjoying horror, whether it be in a movie, a TV show, a game, a book, is totally fine. I enjoy them as well. It's totally fine when you understand that it is fiction, that it shouldn't be replicated and when you're in the right headspace for it. I just wanted to quickly clarify that. Matthew's favourite horror movie franchise was the Saw franchise. He was obsessed and he would religiously watch these over and over and over. For those of you out there who have never seen the Saw films, I'm just going to give you a quick recap and give you a gist about what the film's about. But bear in mind, I've never seen them neither. This is just what I could find on the internet. So I'm sorry if this doesn't ring true to all of the films. I know there's like 10 now. So in the Saw films, the villain is Jigsaw and his famous catchphrase includes him asking his victims if they want to play a game. You don't know me, but I know you. I want to play a game. Super creepy. Jigsaw kidnaps people who he believes are wasting their life or they are not appreciating their life and he puts them through sadistic, life-threatening games in order to test how much they actually want to live. These games are often torturous and include the victim being in a tremendous amount of pain in order to try and escape with their life. So in the films, Jigsaw has complete control over his victims. He can get them to do anything that he wants and Matthew admires that. He is a person who wants control control over everyone. In October 2011, a new resident moved into the hostel. This was 45-year-old Glaswegian veteran Richard Hamilton. Richard was addicted to drugs and alcohol and he, just like Matthew, was given the opportunity to move into the hostel to try and get clean. His room was situated pretty much directly opposite Matthew, so the two men quite quickly became very familiar with each other. Because of this, Richard's focus on sobriety didn't last long. He couldn't resist the temptations surrounding him. The two men formed an alliance and they came up with an agreement where they would take turn buying drugs and then share them between each other. So for example, when Matthew got paid his benefits, he would buy all of the drugs and then him and Richard would share them and vice versa. When Richard got paid his benefits, he would buy all the drugs and share them between him and Matthew. The relationship between Matthew and Richard wasn't like a friendship. Matthew saw Richard as someone who was vulnerable and someone that he could control. Despite how similar they were on terms of stuff that they have experienced in their lives, including homelessness, addiction, estranged families, and not really having anyone, they had polar opposite personalities. Richard was described as easygoing, introverted, quiet and shy, and someone who was always sad. Richard grew up in the care system and throughout his whole life he had no one. No family, no one that seemed to love or care about him, he had no support system, no one that he could rely on and he craved this, he really wanted to have someone that cared about him, he wanted to feel like he mattered and he belonged. Because of his excessive drug and alcohol consumption, Richard's body was slowly shutting down. Because of this, he was classed as disabled, so along with regular benefits, he would also receive disability living allowance. When Matthew realised this, realised that Richard was having another income, that he was getting about another £600 a month than he was, he began to grow jealous. So now Matthew is hyper aware of everything that Richard's doing and what he's spending. And as he is watching Richard spend his own money, he's growing more and more angry and jealous and just obsessed because he cannot do the same. But honestly, Matthew had no reason to be jealous of Richard. He was known to be a very generous man and probably with the hope of trying to make friends. If someone within the hostel was struggling, Richard would help them out. He would give them money when they asked so if Matthew really was struggling likely Richard would have helped him out without a second thought. Matthew tries to conjure up a plan to get Richard to give over his bank card and his pin number. 
Matthew doesn't want the money to help him get by and to help him within his daily life. He wants the money so that he can buy as much drugs as he pleases and so that he can buy anything that he wants. In his head, that's his money and in his head he's already spent it. He already knows what he wants to buy. So when he's looking at Richard, he's seeing him as like a big pound sign. The card Matthew could easily steal. He could swipe it out of Richard's hand. He could steal it while Richard was out, but he can't get any money without the pin and only Richard knows that pin so Matthew decides he's going to do what he does best and try to bully and intimidate Richard into giving them both over. Matthew would begin to push and shove Richard at any opportunity that he could. He would shout and scream at him, trying to humiliate him. And another resident actually recalled a time when he had witnessed Matthew punching Richard in the head. This resident pulled Matthew and said, like, what was all that about? He asked him, why had he just done that? And Matthew said it was because he was sick of Richard's attitude. Matthew done a lot of this type of stuff to pretty much everyone in the hostel. Everyone was cautious of him and everyone just tried to stay out of his way. Again, he was a very intimidating bully. One resident actually reported that they were scared for their life being in the hostel with Matthew. After one day, he had gone up to their room, knocked on their door, they opened the door, and he's just stood there just holding a knife up at them, and they were terrified. But even after reporting this, seemingly nothing was done, and Matthew was allowed to continue to live in the hostel. But now that Matthew has this fixation and this obsession on Richard, everything is going directly towards him. He's making his life a live in hell with constant harassment and bullying but to Matthew's surprise his plan doesn't work. Instead of giving in and handing over the bank card and pin number to stop the harassment and to please Matthew, Richard begins to avoid him as much as possible and stay out of his way and in doing so he essentially isolates himself. Richard very sparsely leaves his room and when he does it's either in the dead of night or when he knows that Matthew is out. Although Richard is cooped up in his room pretty much 24-7, he is still the only thing on Matthew's mind and the fact that Matthew can't get to him to continue to try and bully him and to give him his bank card and pin number over, he's getting more and more agitated and angry. He is not forgetting about Richard and he is not forgetting about the bank card and money. For Matthew it's not out of sight out of mind Richard is the only thing on his mind constantly and it's driving him up the wall because he's thinking about how much drugs he should be able to have how high he could be right now if Richard would give him the money and in doing so he's getting himself more and more angry with Richard who is doing nothing wrong after about four weeks of this Matthew decides that he's had enough and that he needs to take action Matthew decides that his plan of trying to bully and harass Richard into giving his bank card and pin number isn't working and that he needs to step it up and become physical. He thinks about his favourite villain Jigsaw and how he can get anyone to do anything that he wants and he's mesmerised by it and he begins to rationalise it thinking well if Jigsaw can get people to do what they want then why can't I? If Jigsaw can do it without getting called by the police then why can't I? He begins to genuinely imagine himself doing something like Jigsaw could do. The documentary Copycat Killers alleged that Matthew tried to recreate one of his favourite traps from the Saw 6 movie to use on Richard. This one I believe is called Spine Cutter where something is attached to the victim's spine and if they don't successfully escape from it or they don't do what they're told this will sever their spinal cord. So Matthew tried to create his own device like this one but he was unsuccessful so so instead he picked up the sharpest knife he could find and headed over to Richard's room. On the 28th of March 2012 Matthew broke into Richard's room and found that it was empty. Richard had actually gone out to collect a prescription. He begins to scour and search all around Richard's room to see if he can find any money lying about and then he laid in wait for hours for Richard's return. 
it was around 2 a.m when richard got back to the hostel and went into his room he went inside and went and stood sort of in front of his window when out of nowhere matthew pounced on him the two men struggle for a little bit but matthew quite easily is able to overpower richard who he had taken completely off guard he begins demanding that richard hand over his bank card and pin number but surprisingly richard is still refusing he is not giving it over and as he is continuously refusing and saying no matthew is getting angrier and angrier and more impatient he lodges the sharp knife into richard's neck and he threatens him saying if you don't give over the bank card and pin number i am going to kill you the threats don't persuade Richard any further and this is when Matthew begins to stab Richard in an uncontrollable frenzy. Three of these stabs slash at Richard's spinal cord leaving him incapacitated. It's believed that this is where Matthew was targeting so that he could try reenact his favourite trap, spine cutter. As Richard is screaming and crying in pain and horror, Matthew once again demands the card and pin number and terrified for his life, not only physically paralysed but paralysed in fear, Richard finally hands it over and Matthew is ecstatic. He now has what he wants. He thinks he's holding like the golden ticket to the chocolate factory because he's looking at this now and he's just thinking about all of the drugs he can buy. He's thinking about how high he can get and he is on top of the world he looks down to Richard who is obviously incapacitated he's clinging on to life he knows that Richard is under his complete control he is defenseless and Matthew decides that he's going to finish him off Richard would sustain a total of 17 stab wounds each wound being deeper and delivered with much more force than the last now feeling satisfied that Richard is almost pretty much dead, Matthew leaves the room and leaves Richard to die alone on the floor. Matthew races over to his own room where he begins to clean himself up, washing away Richard's blood. This murder was so savage that he was covered in it. He stripped off his blood soaked clothes and begins to dispose of them in separate bin liners and over the course of the next few hours he goes up and down from the communal bins disposing of these black bin bags which contain the blood soaked clothes. He then makes a start on meticulously cleaning his own room. From what I could gather he was so covered in blood that it's possible he might have left like a little trail or when he got back into his own room he leaned against something or something like that so he got to work on scrubbing his room top to bottom and then also cleaning the murder weapon the knife Matthew then goes on to get so high that he completely forgot about the whole crime scene, the whole murder scene inside of Richard's room, literally across the corridor, including Richard's decomposing body. Over the next few days, Matthew was off his face 24 seven. He was on a massive drug binge. As he sat across the hall in his own room, happy and high as a kite that he's got what he wants. He thinks now he's got like an unlimited supply of drugs coming his way he's never got to worry about where he's going to get money for drugs from he sees Richard's bank card as his ticket for stress-free drug buying I guess and he's so happy that he's got this Richard and the whole murder scene is just at the back of his mind now just like everything else in his life cleaning the murder scene trying to get rid of Richard's body trying to conceal it at all becomes secondary to Matthew's addiction the first thing on his mind is the drugs it would be eight days later that Matthew made his first withdrawal from Richard's bank. He stole £240 and spent every penny of it on crack cocaine. Matthew is now feeling confident that he has got away with this horrific murder because no one's talking, no one's concerned about Richard, no one's asking where he is and seemingly no one is missing him which I think is so sad like imagine going missing for eight days and no one's batting an eyelid no one is wondering where you are this actually makes me think right now how often were the residents even getting checked in on like in the hostel because you'd think it would be at least once a week here it is all like independent living they're not like constantly being monitored but you would assume that they were at least getting checked on like how have they not noticed that Richard was missing for eight days how have they not noticed that he's been murdered 
if they'd just gone to his room to check on him they would literally see him because he is still there he's still lay in his room decomposing so how have they not noticed that and how have they not noticed that Matthew is literally off his face for eight days straight in this hostel where he's supposed to be trying to get clean that's just really set like a question mark off in me head because surely you would think that they were getting checked up on on the 9th of April, just under two weeks after the murder, one of the other residents in the hostel is walking past Richard's door when he stops and he realises that he hasn't seen Richard in a while. Again, before his murder, Richard had become a bit of a recluse because he was actively trying to avoid Matthew, who was harassing him. So when Richard had not been seen in a couple of days, it didn't ring any alarm bells for any other of the residents because, again, he had become a bit of a recluse. But I guess this man who's walking past his door on this day is thinking like, when is the last time I've seen Richard? So this man decides that he wants to stop and check in on Richard. He knocks on the door but gets no answer. He then calls out to Richard like, Richard, it's me. Are you in there? Are you okay? But again, he is just met with nothing. There is silence from inside the room. This man then decides that he is going to go inside of Richard's room. He clutches the door handle, twists and opens the door and upon entering, this is when he finds the body of 45 year old Richard Hamilton lay dead in a pool of his own blood and his room is saturated with blood. Blood is on almost every surface. This man promptly turns around, runs out of the room, contacts the police and by 4.20 p.m. the police have arrived at the Sherland Road Hostel and have cordoned off the room. Upon arrival, it is crystal clear that this is the scene of a horrific homicide. CSI begin to process the scene. They're looking for blood, fingerprints, DNA, basically anything that they can so that they can compare this to Richard. And if there is any foreign blood, hair or DNA, this will aid them in helping finding Richard's killer. They're pretty confident that they're going to find something because this is such a horrific scene. The murder seemed to be so brutal. So they're thinking that there's no way that the killer managed to do all of this and not leave anything behind. But there's also the fact that it looks like there's been no efforts to clean up the scene at all. So in a way, the scene has been perfectly preserved and there's been no tampering of evidence whatsoever. So they're thinking that they know that the DNA is in here. They know that the answer to who killed Richard is inside this room. They just need to find it. In the meantime, detectives are getting to work talking to all of the other residents in the hostel and they hear some very disturbing stories about one resident in particular. Can you take a guess who that might be? Of course, it is Matthew Tinling. Detectives learned that over the past few weeks, Matthew had been relentlessly bullying and harassing and targeting Richard. However, more recently, i.e. the past few days, he had been making threats to kill other residents and saying that he had already killed someone before and describing how he had done it in graphic detail. While relaying how he had already killed someone, Matthew was said to have relished in reliving it and he got excited he went into minute detail, not leaving anything to the imagination. I believe that there was two separate incidences where Matthew had threatened to kill another resident after Richard had been murdered. Investigators realised that Richard's bank card appears to be missing, so his wallet is sent off for analysis and they go and check his bank to see if his card has been used or if anything looks different, and it does. From what I could gather, Richard was very consistent in withdrawing his money on payday. So when he got paid, he would go and draw the money out. It never sort of built up in his bank account. However, within the last eight days or so, he had had two separate payments, both of which weren't taken out. And then he had a big chunk of money, £240 withdrawn, which struck them as an anomaly. Investigators gathered and combed through CCTV in the surrounding areas. The hostel didn't have a CCTV camera that was pointing directly onto that. However, there were a couple more in the surrounding areas that kind of showed the hostel a little bit. So police sat and they combed through and they watched them. On one of the cameras, it captures Richard returning back to the hostel on the 28th of March. And the way that this camera is set up, you can see Richard's bedroom window. Again, it's not pointing directly onto it, but it is just in the frame. When investigators are watching this footage, they see at around 2 a.m. there seems to be some sort 
of commotion going on in Richard's bedroom because his curtains are flapping away and they're flapping away for a couple of minutes until they just abruptly stopped and it's believed that this is when Matthew pounced on Richard, attacked him and ultimately killed him. An examination of the curtains would find that there was two sets of DNA extracted from blood splatter that had splashed onto the curtains. This DNA belonged to Richard Hamilton and Matthew Tinling. Matthew's fingerprints were also found on Richard's wallet and a CCTV camera had captured him when he was doing those many trips up and down from the bins when he was disposing of the blood-soaked clothes. I believe that by the time the police are discovering this, the bins had long been emptied and trying to trace down those black bin bags to see what would have been inside would have been almost impossible. With all of this evidence, police arrest 25-year-old Matthew on suspicion of murder. His trial began at the Old Bailey in 2013, where he entered a plea of not guilty. Throughout the trial, it was said that he showed no remorse and he was emotionless. He would go on to be found guilty of the murder of Richard Hamilton and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 30 years to serve. The judge commented to Matthew saying, quote, you inflicted 17 wounds during the attack, the most serious of which was delivered specifically with the intention of severing the spinal cord, thus to cause paralysis and death, exactly as you had seen on a DVD. Whether or not that was Saw 6 found by the police in your room or another series doesn't matter. Plainly, it was something you had seen and tried to imitate. In 2016, Matthew was yet again back in a courtroom faced with an attempted murder charge. While serving his time at HMP Woodhill, he and one of his fellow inmates who he had befriended, a man named Jason Gomez, who was also a convicted killer, had used sandpaper to sharpen a toilet brush to create a weapon. They then attacked one of their fellow inmates, stabbing him in the neck, in the torso and in the eye. During this trial, he and Jason just did not take it seriously at all. Jason would tell the judge that he was the good looking one and Matthew would laugh, saying he has been a very naughty boy. Only very recently, Matthew has yet again had his minimum term sentence extended. This means that he won't be able to apply for parole until 2062 and he'll be about 76 years old. This came after he attacked a prison guard. He had hidden a shank in his mouth and stabbed this prison guard in the neck trying to kill them. And that is today's case. So what do you all think? Was Matthew inspired by the horror movies and that's why he went on to commit murder? Was watching horror movies the thing that put the idea in his head or was he just evil and would he have committed murder in any ways? Comment down below and let me know what you think. I am always super interested to know what you all think. Thank you so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe and to click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I also cover true crime in shorter form over on my TikTok. You can find the link for that in the description box below. I also have a Google form doc down there. So if you have any cases that you'd like me to cover on my YouTube channel, make sure you go and fill that form out. I do not take requests from the comments of the videos. If you have enjoyed this video please make sure to give it a thumbs up that would really help me out and if you want to hear more true crime cases covered by me I have plenty on my channel that you can go ahead and watch right now. So yeah I'm gonna leave today's video at that. Thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me today. You know I'm so so grateful for all of your support and I will see you all on my next one.